Welcome to Aurora Institute's webinar on supporting the learner throughout their competency-based journey, examining tech standards. My name is Natalie Slocum. I'm the Strategic Partnerships Director here at Aurora Institute, and I'll be helping to facilitate today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. Seeing lots of folks introduce themselves in the chat box. Uh, it's great to see who you are and where you're tuning in from, and I encourage you all to Continue introducing yourself and keeping the conversations and questions coming. Um, if you could shift to the next slide, please. Um, please introduce yourself and ask and answer questions in the chat. We love a really rich dialogue there. And we also encourage you to share what you're learning on social media too. You can tag us at Aurora Institute and use hashtag Aurora 2020. And today's webinar is being recorded and archived. We'll send everyone a link to the full webinar recording and a link to the slide deck after today's session. Um, so you'll be able to refer back to this at any time and share that openly with your colleagues as well. Next slide, please. And one more. So today I am so honored to be joined by Michael J. Jean Kitchens and Brant Red on today's very important topic. So um, I will go ahead and now turn it over to Michael to kick us off. Michael, it's all you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Natalie. And uh, I'm going to just apologize to everybody out there that I'm not ignoring you. There we go. Before the pandemic, just so you know what I really looked like and now what I look like since the last few months. Um, uh, I apologize because my, my presentation is on this screen and you are all right there. So I'm not sliding you and I, I don't know how to make my eyes do that. So uh, I'm going to look around a little bit. So um, talking about, uh, uh, about uh, competency-based um, learning, you know, to some extent, I don't know how many of you this classroom probably does not look familiar necessarily, at least not black and white probably. But in fact, you know, here the teacher was, it, it may be the back of the room here, but in fact is leading a group of students in a very directed way. The kids are at least behaving themselves for this photograph. Um, and uh, everything is clear. And I just want to point out, there's some wonderful turkeys there up on top. So it's a timely um, photo as well, given where we are in the year. But um, this is not the state of our classrooms today, much less where we want to see learning go going today. Beep. There we go. So evolution of the uh, uh, guiding documents. Guiding documents is a term that, that I coined many, 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 many years ago because we talk about a whole variety of different kinds of documents that provide guidance about learning um, and what happens in the classroom. And there are so many different words for those. So if we think about that, um, back when that photo was taken, in many cases, the educator was really the source of curriculum or direction around what was taking place in that classroom. If you go to the next one, Brand, um, it really became then the textbook. And, uh, you know, there were some very, very standard textbooks, particularly the elementary classroom. And that what is what determined was going to be taught. And everybody did so in a lockstep fashion. Next one. Um, then we sort of did a one level back abstraction where we think about curriculum um, as being uh, an abstraction, but then the textbook is aligned very, very closely to that curriculum. And in most cases, and this is probably a lot of you are familiar with this, the curriculum was the textbook. Um, which is a sad state of affairs, but in fact, that's that's often the case. Um, and and uh, even when I was in the classroom many years ago, next Brant. We then, I think, had a major advancement, and that was the development of the frameworks documents in many, many, many states, which was another level of abstraction, but really a way to be able to engage the educator um, in thoughtful uh, reflection about their teaching, what was going to be taught, and it was not meant to be curriculum, but in fact, provide guidance to that. If we go to the next, I think we kind of took a little bit of a step back with the standards with a more directive approach. Um, and uh, in, again, the intent was never that the standards would be curriculum, but I think because of some of the high stakes assessment, um, that became the case. And then I think we really are hitting our stride when we think about competencies. And when you look at that sort of history, um, that hierarchy, you can see where it combines those. And I'll talk a little bit about the relationship between competency standards, frameworks, and the like. But um, I think it's important to have that historical perspective to appreciate the, the real benefit that competencies brings to us. 
Um, so if you look at competencies versus standards, some of you who are involved with competency works, um, you may be well steeped in this, ignore me or correct me, better yet, in the chat if you have an alternative approach. Um, I think standards describe what learners should know and be able to do in relation to, and this is critical in established uh, criteria, whereas competencies really, again, take us that one step up um, in terms of describing how students apply and transfer their learning um, to new contexts and situations. And um, often, of course, competencies are, are, are described by multiple standards, um, skills, any number of other kinds of statements that are a sub part of that. So being the science educator I am, I gave just an example here, a standard might be be able to accurately read an analog thermometer or be able to calculate humidity using a wet bulb and dry bulb thermometers. But then if you think about the competency that will be associated with that, we're talking about collecting data using instruments to describe atmospheric uh, conditions and predict weather. You can see that next level up that then consists of a lot of other information underneath um, as part of that. I think another important part about that competency is that, um, is that you can, um, you can address that at a variety of different uh, age levels or preparation levels and not necessarily in lockstep. And it can be done in some very, very interesting ways. And so I think that's the big benefit that competencies um, really bring. But it does require a certain amount of, of, of distillation and pulling apart and thinking about how that competency fits. Let's go to the next slide because I know I get into that. Um, I think we got a number of good things from NCLB. I'm not sure what any of you think about NCLB, not a big fan. Um, but I will let you know that I think some of the big benefits that came with NCLB, um, one is the data pipes. Um, I think before we had NCLB, um, we weren't trying to move data in quite the same way. And I think that with NCLB, there at least became pressure to move some data, whether it was the right data is a whole nother question. But in fact, moving data was absolutely critical. Another one was parsing of the statements that are contained within these kind of documents. The fact that it's not just a, a, a random list of, not even, I wouldn't see random, it's not just a, a list of statements that are organized in a way to be able to address sort of learning and bed to be consumed in an analog fashion, but in fact, the ability to be able to parse those statements and digitize them and make them available so you can see the relationship between that and all the other things that are happening um, as part of the learning experience. The next one is a drive towards referenceability. That's the ability to be able to uniquely be able to identify particular statements, whether it's a competency, a standard, a skill, or what that is. And you'll see some of that in both Jeannie and, and Brandt's presentations here as well. And the last one is just an overall um, appreciation of the, the need for interoperability, I think really became very clear in that way. I remember when I first served on the SIF, the Schools Interoperability Framework Board, people went, inner what? Um, and now it seems to roll off people's tongues. So um, that's always kind of interesting. So let's go to the next slide, Brent. So the catch with competencies, of course, is, you know, what does it mean to achieve a competency is really a big question. Um, so competencies, as I already said, are, const are usually comprised of multiple skills, and the skills are almost always easier to measure. They're usually more discrete. Um, but in fact, when you're looking at a competency, it's much, much more difficult um, to capture that. And um, I think when we, with the benefits that are associated with those competencies as it relates to sort of the student journey is, number one, it, it it really appeals to, it, it really um, uh, is a good fit with hybrid assessments, looking at a variety of different ways of assessing student learning and student knowledge. Another one is that it lends itself to personal artifacts of understanding, meaning that you're not just looking for standardized kinds of assessments, but in fact, a number of different ways. I have to say, just for full disclosure, um, I am a banana slug, meaning that I went to UC Santa Cruz. So um, we only had, um, uh, we had no grade grade uh, grades given there at all. So I'm already um, uh, pre, pre, uh, uh, pre, not predetermined, I'm pre uh, disposed um, to non traditional kinds of assessments. And I do think there's some real benefits there. And I remember going to graduate school, and I got an A and I said, So what, what does that mean? 
And they said, you should just be happy. You got an A. And I said, but I don't know what I learned about part of that. I love the idea that competencies lend themselves to that. And the last one is that competencies lend themselves to multiple contexts and applications of knowledge. And it happens at multiple places throughout the learning. So rarely would you have a competency where you can just check off after a single assessment that you've addressed that competency. And I think that's a key to the nature of how that affects our learning and that learning journey um, that, that, that that student is taking. Fran? Um, so I think when we think about standards and competencies, I think it's important to recognize that um, in general, first of all, our communities define themselves by their shared uh, beliefs and priorities, meaning that when you think about the community you live in, and I'm very active, by the way, in the League of Women Voters, so just put a little call out there. But um, one of the things that we stress within the League of Women Voters is that communities need to engage in conversations about who they are and what things they believe in and what are those shared beliefs and it's an ongoing conversation. I would say that learning communities very much do the same thing and that is the kind of engagement that needs to happen and not just come from down high but in fact needs to bubble up from below and really be the discussion about who who our schools are, who they're serving, and how they're serving them. So an, an interesting example of how that sometimes doesn't work, if you think about Common Core, um, conceptually good, of course. Um, let's do have a common set, but it really missed the social components um, of that. Well, we certainly saw people providing input into Common Core, um, and we saw eventually the demand be that there's 85% common, and 15% local, that sort of became the de facto, um, it just doesn't work. Um, and it isn't good. If, you, if you're a rabid constructivist like I am, where you believe that people really do build understanding, you really want those competencies and other things to come up from, from the community. It doesn't mean that they don't bear resemblance to others, and you certainly should learn from what others are doing, but there needs to be internal ownership um, of, of, uh, of, of those competencies. So there's a deep understanding for those of you who are science fiction fans, you need to be able to grok um, what that means at a deeper level than simply just knowing what the words say. So let's go to the next slide, Brant. Um, I saw there was somebody on the call here from Utah, um, and I saw Todd Call speak uh, yesterday. I was uh, I was attending. I'm still attending the um, the CETA conference, um, and Todd used actually this slide, which I substituted for another one I was going to use, just trying to be timely here. Um, and if you look at Utah's vision. Um, when they think about competencies, there is Sid just sent a note out. There we go. Um, and uh, when you look at the competencies that they're really including, it's an interesting set. And I think it makes that point about community ownership of that process. If you look at those that are in blue, um, where it says mastery, I mean, the one that's furthest to the left says academic mastery. We get that. Then we see another one, digital mastery. Then we see wellness. What does wellness have to do with learning? Well, in fact, it has a lot to do with learning and the ability and the skills that we want our students to have. And then we have civic and financial economic literacy, but they've gone a step further in Utah, which is to include this issue of autonomy um, and then purpose as well. And so this is clearly a, a set of characteristics that are owned by that community that have been, people have been involved in creating and owning as part of that process. And, and again, I think that's really uh, an important process um, as we go through that. So um, next. <clears throat> so um, a modern definition of truth. I was trying to think about um, uh, about learning and how do we go about that? And I was looking for the cover of that Steve Jobs book, but go ahead and click brand. Um, and that is that, of course, there, the journey is the reward. But what I found when you do a Google search, truth is to be found when you can find all these different contexts. There are so many more for that phrase, journey is the reward. But in fact, the journey is the reward. It's really the key component to how that learning takes place. And I say that for communities of learners. I say that for educators, for the community itself. Um, and and it's, it's easy to say, it's hard to assess, um, but it is such a critical part in terms of influences who we are and how we behave and how we work and really, really does support that competency-based learning approach. Let's go to the next slide. So I, I love this. I actually did license this, by the way, to use it in case any of you are copyright uh, 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 cautious. Um, so this is great, uh, Family Circus. So remember class, the shortest distance from point A to point B um, is, is the fastest. But in fact, here's Billy, um, is a straight line. 
And here's Billy, he says, but a crooked line is far more fun. And in fact, one of the things that we do know is that um, fun has a lot to do with how we learn. Um, and the ability to make connections and make that knowledge really useful and very, very much a part of the competency process. Um, so I, I just love following all the things that Billy does along, <coughs> along the way and looks a lot like my career. So um, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this as well. Um, let's go, Brant. Um, so, you know, uh, while we support sort of a localization as we think about um, these competencies, um, that journey is really critical as well. And that means that we're going to journey from community to community. We're going to have to find ways to, as part of that learner process, we're going to be moving from one state to another, from one school to another. And there, there needs to be a way to be able to move between these standards and competencies, which are more localized. And, and I, I sort of kiddingly say, have you read the standards or competencies? I mean, they are meant to be implementable, but they're still very much politically and socially constructed documents. Um, and, you know, one can argue that that's not the case, but good luck. Um, because uh, we've just seen that over time. So we do need to find a way to mediate between competencies. And again, you're going to hear a lot of that in Jeannie um, and Brandt's uh, presentation here as well. Let's go to the next slide. So um, I'm just talking about uh, Brandt and I both work with an organization, uh, Matchmaker Education Labs, and we provide technologies that allow you to be able to match competencies to competencies, competencies to standards, competencies to learning resource, competencies to curriculum, competencies to skills. Um, and you can do anything between all those pieces. And the reason why we do that, um, and I hopefully what I've said so far builds to this, is we really believe in liberating learning. Um, the idea being that, that having this as a lockstep process where everybody needs to be following the same set of competencies, the same set of standards, is just unrealistic. And it ignores the needs of the learner um, and how learners learn. So the idea that you can dynamically relate these to each other and do so in a way where there's still accountability, but at the same time you've addressed uh, the, the learner's interests and their needs is absolutely key. And I think that the technologies and the standards that we're sharing today are, go a long way to moving us to uh, where we need to be. So with that, I think I'm going to turn this over to you, Brant. I'll, I'll look through if there were any questions in the in the chat here as well. I've kind of ignored that. So. Oh, Sid, you presented with Todd. So there we go. I should have just let you speak to that slide. <laughs> and actually, it's uh, Jeannie who's coming up next. So, oh, Jeannie, uh, right. Sorry, Jeannie. <laughs> Handing it off That's to her. Okay. Michael's a tough one to follow there. You've got a fan club. You've got <laughs> number one here. <laughs> um, yep. Let me go ahead and we just go on to the next slide here. And, you know, Michael started off with that, remember the back in the day when life was so much easier, and this is what more realistic of what things look like now, right? All the different ways of learning. And it can be so much easier. It can. So let's take a look. Um, I would be curious to know how many of you are familiar with Credential Engine. Um, and if you're not, our mission, we're a nonprofit in um, <clears throat> located in Washington, DC. And our mission has to, everything to do with uh, credential transparency, but to have credential uh, transparency, of course, we have to have competency um, information as well, along with those credentials. And I'll go talk about um, <clears throat> the infrastructure, the open infrastructure that we've created that anyone can use to share this kind of information. But in addition to that, we're all about collaboration and empowerment and um, welcome all of you to learn more about Credential Engine. And we can go on. Um, so we have a set of technologies. These are all open and freely available for anyone who wants to take information and publish it as interoperable linked data. And I'm not gonna get too much into the weeds here, but you have to know a little bit about us as I go over some of the the, the ways that we're <clears throat> trying to address some of the, the um, issues that Michael was talking about. So we started off with a credential transparency description language, which is an open common language for describing any type of credential available in the marketplace and all kinds of things about them. We have a set of open publishing tools that are completely free to use where you can take information about credentials and competencies and use uh, a number of different ways to publish that information. And that information go into a national credential registry 
that is aimed at fostering basically an open marketplace. It's data that um, is in there under an open license about credentials that anyone can use in their own systems or applications. And if you'd like to see what it looks like, you can check out the credential finder. And I'll show you more about that in a moment. We can go on. <clears throat> and the reason that this is important um, is uh, there's over 700,000 unique types of credentials in the United States alone. As a matter of fact, um, Credential Engine is getting ready to release a new counting credentials report. Um, we did one last year that found this unique 738,000 number, and we've found even more. So it's important to have um, information that can be unpacked and is useful as our students get into jobs or as they want to transfer whatever it is they've done and learned and earned in their competencies to other things, to other training, uh, to other jobs for job advancement and so forth. And we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> and this little crazy picture here um, is meant to give you a good idea of all the kinds of things that the credential transparency description language can describe, and we're not going to get into all the little arrows there, um, but what you're seeing are all the rich descriptions that range from, of course, competencies to conditions to earn a credential to the occupations they prepare for, cost, time to complete, levels, and much, much more. So the CTDL is foundational um, to all of the credential engines work, and we can go to the next slide. Um, and the data that's in the registry is all in there as linked data using that CTDL. And so you could put the data in, in any of our, with any of our open tools. And on the other side, that data is available for being consumed. And we can go on. And then the Credential Finder is a, is a website that you can check out. And the purpose of it is to, for you to see what's in the registry. It provides information about all the data published to date that's in the registry. It's a moving target because there could be anything published anytime for credentials, learning opportunities, assessments, or competencies. And this is, this is information about the offerings, not about the earners, not about the people that have been issued credentials to. Um, <clears throat> so I'll talk more about that in just a moment when we talk about learning and employment records. We can go ahead. <clears throat> so learning and employment records, um, what we want to see today, of course, is a digital, a di digital record of learning. <clears throat> and I think there's probably some folks on here that probably don't even really like that word record because a record kind of implies an old school connotation of a, of a record that an institution holds and that you don't have any control over. But really what we're talking about here is something a little more futuristic where we want people to have control over their own records. Um, and, <clears throat> uh, and we want it to be digital, we want it to be interoperable. So if you're going from one school to another school or doing something informally, um, or you're looking for a job or you're getting a promotion and so forth, that a person and here we have our fictitious test person Jan Martin on the right here, and we can see his um, kind of wallet app, um, and that <clears throat> where um, Jan controls his achievements or credentials. Um, and so if we go on to the next slide, don't worry about being able to read this. There's a lot of text here, um, but the point here is that Jan is a user story. It's an example from Velocity Network Foundation. Credential Engine is a member of this foundation. And there is a story here about Jan and why Jan needs to have um, credentials that are verified um, to have been issued and why Jan needs them and how Jan is going to use those credentials to achieve um, this person's um, training and employment goals. So if we go on and go here <clears throat> to the ecosystem, so where does the credential engine, where does the credential registry fit with LER? So here is kind of a snapshot of the ecosystem where we have credentialing organizations on the left that are issuing credentials to learners. And you can see a little arrow going to the earner where they have, might have many different credentials. 
And that credentialing organization can also publish information about those credentials and competencies and the CTDL to the registry. And then those learner um, and employment records can use that information in the CTDL and in the registry to offer employers and other credentialing organizations and other you know, people that need to know more about the credentials and the competencies that this person has earned. So if we go on to the next, <clears throat> here on the first slide, we saw Jan's um, uh, oh, um, screenshot of his wallet. And this is a real um, pilot. So these are real screenshots of test information where Jan has is claiming a credential that Jan earned. And you could see it's a wound care um, from the Wound Care Education Institute. And um, uh, in, this, in this picture here, Jan in his wallet has claimed that credential and it is a verified credential by the organization that offers it. And if we go to the next slide, here we can see that Jan in his wallet application can see information about that credential um, that was earned and that Jan needs to um, give this information to another organization so they can see proof that Jan has completed this. And also um, what's included here on the far right side uh, where it says 5B is a URL to more information about that credential in the credential registry. So now we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> And this is a screenshot. Um, this is something you can actually see in the credential finder where um, the organization that offers this particular course, which earned Jan that credential is published to the registry. And we could see that um, Jan would have earned 18 competencies through completing it. And if we go on to the next slide, <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> we would have clicked on that little blue box that said competencies, and we can see the checklist of all the, the competencies um, that were earned in completing it. And if we go on to one more slide about this, we can see if we want to really check it out and see, okay, well, what does this data look like in this credential registry? You can click in the bottom right-hand corner of any of the detail pages in the credential finder and you could see the raw data, metadata in the registry that's encoded as the CTDL that then created um, the web page that you just saw and data that is useful to the um, training organization and the employers that Jan wants to um, transfer the value of that um, training that he completed and that credential that he earned. So that kind of just told the full story there. And if we go to the next slide, <clears throat> um, there are a number of ways if anyone is interested in participating with Credential Engine or with um, uh, pilots for a learner and employment records. Um, I have a whole bunch of information here for you to get as involved as, you're, as you would like. And that should do it for me. So Jeannie, you had a question yeah. in the chat about oh, um, okay. Good. about uh, about the uh, about whether it manages data for adults or um, students or who who is it intended for? So the credential registry doesn't have any personally identifiable information, so you wouldn't find any students in there. It's not a credential issuing platform. The learner and employment record wallet was the way through which um, platforms issue the credentials to the person. The registry is holding rich descriptions of credentials, competencies, learning opportunities, and assessments. And those all come from the offerers. So the credentialing organizations that offer certificates, any kind of degrees, certifications, occupational licenses, so it's really intended for any kind of you know, education or occupational credential at any level. So from a beginner level to postdoctoral um, levels are all supported through the CTDL and um, the credential registry. And did I answer that question?
I think you did, but we'll see if that person <laughs> puts a note in the chat. Um, there's another question here, which I'd actually like to answer as well. Um, this question was from Wendy about, can you clarify the grain size of the competencies in the registry? Looks like competencies are smaller than a typical standard. Other definitions of competencies suggest that it encompasses multiple standards, so bigger grain size. And I, if I can just go first, and then Jeannie, I can hand it to you. Um, the technology that we have with it, MediaSeq um, uses something that we call an intermediary, and it is very fine-grained. Um, <clears throat> and has a particular structure and other metadata associated with it that allows us to be able to uh, relate things to one another. And so I'll turn that to Jeannie to answer for uh, for her work. Yeah, the um, what the registry does and what the CTDL does is provide a common language and a um, a model. And the model really is the the semantic web. And for describing. Um, competency. So we're not saying, oh, you have to describe a competency a certain way. That's really up to the offer of the credential or whatever the related context is. They're creating those competencies based with a specific context. And so what we're doing is supporting whatever that exact, you know, whatever the exact um, uh, intent is in a couple of ways, the content and the granularity of the competencies. And so competencies, we see you know, this huge range. They might be little like tweet-like things that people might like, oh, what does that even mean? It's like a, it's like a tweet. And we also see very complex, hierarchical, very well-structured frameworks, you know, particularly for like certifications. Um, and regardless of whether it's tweet-like or whether it's very um, you know, hierarchical with very well-written you know, clear competencies um, statements, <clears throat> we can support either way in the registry and each competency statement can be linked. So every competency statement in a competency framework can be linked to, you know, context and aligned to other things. So they can be one framework could have competencies that are aligned to competencies say in another framework. And when I say framework, I mean, that it's a set of competencies that have been assembled together for a for a reason, you know, for a context. It could be a job, it could be a course, you know, a credential, and so forth. Great, Brent. Sounds like I'm up. You're up. Okay. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, I am Brent Red, uh, CTO of Matchmaker Education Lab. So I'm working with Michael on that. And uh, I figured I'd also give you a little bit of my background. I'm also the uh, creator and coordinator. I wouldn't, uh, I, there's a lot of contributors to this of the EdMatrix uh, directory of learning standards. And now when I say learning standards, these are mostly technology standards. So data standards, uh, uh, communication protocols and those sorts of things. We do uh, dabble a little bit in the uh, competency and achievement and design and practice areas, though there are actually other directories that are more effective uh, in those spaces. So, uh, so I've had, uh, due to this role, um, I have get exposed to a lot of standards work. And, uh, and likewise, um, I'm also uh, the secretary of the uh, IEEE Learning Technology Standards Council. So uh, we're working on uh, standards work there. And I'll just mention uh, to this previous question of the granularity of uh, competencies as, as you're trying to write those out. One of the activities that we have uh, underway and Jim Goodell, who's uh, in the audience uh, is, is working with this as well as several others is, is to provide guidelines, not so much a standard, um, but guidelines on well-crafted uh, competency statements. And uh, so that's something that you can turn to as well. I will say that the debate of granularity is not going to be resolved because it really is contextual. Uh, what context, how you're using it, and what subject matter you're talking about is going to influence the granularity that's most effective uh, for your purposes. So from there, I'll, I'll jump in for a minute. I wanted to talk a little bit about progress we've made in the area of competency-based learning. Um, Back in 84, many of you are aware of, of uh, the Bloom, uh, Bloom's Two Sigma problem, where uh, they used a combination of mastery learning and one-on-one uh, and -on -one tutoring uh, to try and measure, really, the goal was how well can a student learn under ideal conditions? 
and uh, and how does that compare with conventional classroom learning? And uh, and the the results came out of two standard deviations, better learning. Um, I've correlated that, and I probably really messed up on the statistics because I'm not a statistician. But I did uh, correlate that with John Hattie's work, Invisible Learning, if you're familiar with that. And two standard deviations uh, um, comes out to roughly four times the learning uh, rate. So uh, in one year of, of learning in a more optimal condition, a, uh, an elementary or, or middle school student might achieve four uh, grades worth of, of achievement if they were given uh, um, or unrestrained by the learning context, if you, uh, as you might say. So ever since then, uh, since he put up that challenge, we've been trying to figure out how to achieve that level of performance among our students at scale. Uh, can we offer that uh, grade of a learning experience? Because these students were being individually tutored by uh, a college grad students uh, in order to, to perform so well. And can we figure out a different way uh, to achieve uh, that same thing? And just some other progress in, in CompC-based learning, Western Governors University is among the leaders in CompC-based. They were formed in 97 and have carried that banner uh, for some time. Uh, no Child Left Behind, as Michael has said, had lots of flaws, but one of the things that it did is it forced uh, states to write competency standards uh, for K-12 education in, uh, in all of the primary subjects. And then the Common Core came in and said, well, maybe we can, uh, can share those standards across state lines instead of doing them independently, and of course generated a bunch of controversy in that process. Something that uh, that uh, most of you are probably aware of a lot of this history, but uh, this one I mentioned in 2011 when Kurt Van Lynn went back and revisited uh, the Two Sigma problem. I, I recommend his paper and uh, and maybe I'll uh, try to track that down and put the link in the chat before we're finished here. But uh, he revisited what Bloom, Bloom's work and went so far as to track down the dissertations written by his grad students to find some detail that wasn't in the original paper. Uh, what he discovered between that and doing a survey of computer um, intelligent tutoring systems is that per human tutors and computer tutors uh, uh, performed all pretty closely to each other. Humans were better, of course, but not by a huge margin. And it begave, started to give us some hope that we might indeed be able to achieve uh, those kinds of levels. Uh, several other um, pilot studies have also shown a very high achievement when you combine uh, a adaptive learning system or an intelligent tutoring system, uh, which is computer driven with, uh, with uh, human counseling and uh, and support and and especially on the uh, social and emotional side, the computer simply cannot substitute for that. And so uh, we we tend to call that coaching. So when you combine coaching with uh, with a good quality uh, online tutoring system, we start to achieve uh, some high levels. Uh, so there's at least some hope for that. In 2012, uh, INACOL, which is now, of course, the Aurora Institute, launched Competency Works as they started their pivot towards a focus on competency-based learning as opposed to online learning. And, uh, and then last year, uh, they completed that, uh, that pivot by actually changing the name of the organization. Uh, and uh, and I, I think that this is really huge kudos to Aurora, in my opinion, because they followed the, the data. They started out by sponsoring studies and learning what's effective in student learning. And as they found that online by itself wasn't the issue, it was whether it's competency focused, uh, then they started to not only spread that evidence, but also change the emphasis of the whole organization to follow uh, what the science was teaching us. Uh, amazing uh, work being done there. And then finally, uh, you know, as we speak, uh, competency-based learning is gaining a lot of attention. In some circles, it's because we realize how much the students are learning this, losing this year uh, in their compromised experiences. Anyone who has a, uh, a, a student in primary, secondary school knows uh, what a challenge it's been. And, uh, and some students are doing okay, given a tremendous amount of parental support. Other students who have parents who aren't quite okay, um, so 
prepared or able uh, are really uh, almost losing a year's worth of their schooling. And so we need to figure out some way to compensate for that uh, in, the, in the coming years as, as we return to at least more in-person um, interaction, although probably a, a different approach to things. So uh, we're making progress in this area and I think we've got some huge opportunities. So I wanted to go over a few scenarios of where uh, competency-based learning shows up. Um, these are a mix. Uh, mostly, um, I admit, uh, the, <laughs> these came from some other work we did, and so not all of them are K-12 focused, but many of them are, such as when I'm developing a new learning product, uh, which competencies should I be addressing, and how should those be organized? Um, what about uh, school transfer? The example I use here is at the uh, uh, post-secondary level, but it's equally the same going from elementary school to el elementary school, especially in the United States. If I'm crossing state lines, I may very well be looking at a whole new uh, competency framework that the new schools are uh, focused on and how do we um, uh, translate my learner record uh, and, which, what, and what I've mastered in all those areas. Um, and, uh, and somebody who's needing some supplementation and uh, would like to have something that at least uh, is in their interest area. Can we find uh, learning resources uh, that fit uh, those people? Well, this personalized and competency-based learning uh, in, our, in our experience seems to happen at the intersection of what we know about the learner and what we know about the learning resources that are available to us. And in this graphic, I use the word data, which is true uh, because I tend to be a technologist, so I'm data focused. But the data is a representation of what we know about uh, these two things. And we can correlate those two, the data we have about the learner and the data we know about have about the learning resources if they are aligned towards competencies. Uh, so that the, we can now start to match up these two records. If we don't have those competencies as a bridge, then, uh, then it's very hard uh, to match things up and actually get an idea of where the learner is in their learning journey. And so uh, coming out of that graphic, uh, we have three things that we're focused on then as, as a data standards effort, uh, the data about the learner, data about the learning resources, and data about the competency frameworks that help align those two. So I just, I'm going to go through a quick summary of some of the ongoing work that is in these areas. This is uh, really kind of scraping the surface, but so I, I haven't picked up everything that's going on, but, uh, but there's some, uh, these are probably the most prominent efforts that are going on right now. So there's a common effort to uh, generate what we call an ILR in some communities. Uh, it's, it's very similar to what Jeannie was talking about with the LER, the learning and employment record. ILR, depending on who you talk to, stands for interoperable, integrated, or independent learner record. And uh, those do have nuanced differences in what they mean. Uh, and uh, in the case of uh, the IEEE standards group, uh, they're calling it an integrated learner record and working on standards that integrate and the, and, uh, the learning records from existing standards, such as the SIF data model that I have listed down here and the comprehensive learner record and, uh, and the um, uh, uh, open badges standard and so on, so that we can put together a, uh, a comprehensive learner record, which is another way of describing this whole thing, of what activities a student has gone through. And this might look like, oh, wow, now we've got all these competing efforts. And some of you have seen the, the comic that says, hey, we've got uh, 12 standards. Uh, we've got to integrate those. Let's come up with the 13th. Um, but uh, in fact, it turns out that uh, if you look at the people who are participating the, in these efforts, it's, uh, you see the same names uh, repeated multiple times. And that's because we have people who are passionate about this, who want to make sure that these are complementary efforts and not competitive uh, efforts. So uh, there's, there's some real hope that we're going to be able to come out with some best practices in, uh, in having that wallet, like Jeannie was talking about a few minutes ago, that uh, shows, here's what I've learned, and I can present that uh, to an organization and say, here are all the competencies I've achieved, and they can verify that these are real, that I didn't just make them up and throw them into my wallet, but in fact, behind every one of those is a verifiable credential that uh, shows that indeed I, I participate in the activities, I passed the assessments, and so forth. 
So this is the data about the learner. What about the data about the learning resources on the other side of this? And again, I'm scratching the surface. There's, a, uh, there's many more, but these are probably the most important uh, efforts uh, at, at the present time. Uh, first is a learning resource metadata initiative. And uh, I, I had the um, opportunity to be among those that kicked that process off back in uh, uh, roughly 2012. Michael Jay was among the, uh, the, the early participants in that, and it's ongoing under the auspices of the Dublin Core uh, Metadata Initiative, which is carrying uh, the banner. But uh, what we've successfully done is defined how, what are the unique properties you need to know about a learning resource and got that built into the schema.org uh, metadata standard, which is uh, a common standard across most of the web for linked data describing uh, any kind of uh, a media or object. And, uh, and so we're able to then describe things in terms of what you might learn uh, from this uh, particular thing or what might it assess um, or what uh, understanding is going to be required before you engage uh, in that particular piece of media. Likewise, uh, the learning metadata uh, project, this is a renewal of the learning object metadata standard from the IEEE, just kicked off um, a couple of months ago, but, uh, but an excellent uh, piece of work. And again, we've got a lot of collaboration going on between the, between the IEEE and the LRMI folks, so that we don't end up with competing, but instead uh, complementary work on those parts. And so before I talk about the data about competency frameworks, it's worth talking about what is a competency framework. And uh, we tend to use a very broad definition here of what a competency framework might be. And I've thrown up some examples of those here. Uh, these are, we've got professional certificates here in the lower right. We've got the common core state standards as you've heard about and the next generation science standards. Uh, certifications like a project management uh, certification um, and, uh, and uh, and on and on. This is, again, you know, as Jeannie pointed out, we have uh, over 700,000 credentials. Each of those credentials has underneath it a set of competencies that you have to achieve in order to be able to uh, re uh, achieve that credential. And so uh, these are frameworks that we have that we can align to. And, uh, and so as we want to make these things interoperable, we need to render these competencies in a format that, uh, that the computers can exchange and put together. Uh, we have three prominent uh, collections. Uh, there are others. Uh, I'm, ONET showed up on the previous screen, uh, which has their own collection of uh, occupational skills and, uh, and so on. And, uh, and so, but uh, these prominent ones, the Achievement Standards Network is probably the granddaddy of them all. It's been around for quite some time. Really fascinating uh, to, to browse through there. And you see the 50 state standards, but you also see competencies in the medical professions and in teaching professions and pedagogy and so forth uh, out there. Um, the IMS uh, Case Network uh, is based on the case uh, standard for, um, for describing competencies. And then uh, Credential Engine, Genie's group, has uh, the CTDL, ASN, as part of their overall suite of uh, data formats. And, uh, and it is uh, based on the ASN schema, but moved into a linked data uh, uh, model, which uh, is, uh, works very, very well in that. And, uh, and then just in the last year, the Open and Competency Framework Collaborative is a project from the T3 Innovation Network, uh, which is uh, um, sponsored by the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation, and they are working on an integrated access to uh, multiple competency framework registries uh, so that you can get a comprehensive set of competencies out there. And so I, I suggest if you're interested in this area to keep an eye on the OCF collab work. Uh, Jeannie happens to be one of the very influential people in that effort. Uh, I wrote uh, the draft specifications, so both of us have, have done some important work on that part. But uh, keep an eye on that. The prototype is nearly finished and they're going to be doing demos in December and January uh, to carry that one forward. So uh, with all of that, uh, we, we run into a challenge. Uh, there is no single competency framework and, uh, and there's no hope of getting a single competency framework. And I think you'd find that the, all of us panelists would argue 
it's a bad idea to cry, try and create a single competency framework. So if that's the case, then what happens with some of these scenarios that I described uh, at the beginning of this presentation? You're moving from school to school, from state to state. You're um, matriculating from K-12 into higher ed. You're going from school into a workforce, and you have to take your competencies that are in your record, and you need to interpret them in a different context. How do, uh, how um, can we manage that situation? Let's say that you're taking all these competencies that are in your record and they're mapped to probably a dozen different competency frameworks uh, from your learning journey. And you want to interpret those in terms of qualifications for a particular career you're looking at, either because you're about to apply for that job and you want to show that you're qualified, or this is a goal of yours and you want to know what gaps you still have, what you need to learn uh, to qualify for that position. Um, or you're, uh, you're moving from one school to another and the school needs to figure out how to place you and not make you do a bunch of redundant work, which is the way they do it now. Well, it doesn't hurt you to repeat work, right? Well, it turns out it does hurt. Um, and, uh, and so trying to avoid uh, that wasted uh, effort on the parts of students. Um, and uh, on and on, we have all kinds of scenarios. Well, I've, I've put the Rosetta Stone here uh, on purpose because what we really need a way is to be able to either translate or interpret um, a competency uh, from one framework to another. And the way we do that is by matching. And uh, we're not gonna have perfect matches, but we can have uh, a match of a collection against another collection that actually has pretty considerable fidelity. So you might not say that this competency is the same as that one because they're probably described different, but you can say that this set of competencies, which is what uh, in the real world, is a very excellent match to this set of competencies on the other side. And that matching work uh, is what's important. And it turns out that is what um, Matchmaker Education Labs is working on. So we're trying to fill that little piece uh, in the overall ecosystem of competency-based learning. As you as you look through all of these different efforts, um, I, I well, I'm tremendously optimistic about uh, about where we're going with uh, with competency-based learning for two reasons. One, because I see momentum behind these efforts with uh, engagement as I participate in these standards groups and so on. I see a real uh, interest. And, and genuine effort uh, to make these systems work together. And concurrently with all of that, I see the evidence, uh, much of which has been collected by Aurora in the Comcy Works effort, uh, evidence that this is the right direction in order to serve the, serve the students well. So I will conclude with all of that. And uh, we have about 10 minutes left uh, for questions and answers. I put a note in the chat um please do let us know if you have any questions mm -hmm. well if they have to do with competencies that's even better yeah so uh, natalie posted a link to van led's paper and yes indeed natalie you found the right one thank you wonderful i'll share that with the group because i just sent that um directly to you oh oh sorry okay. yeah they're right that was a private message you can send it to everyone <laughs> all right Um, there was also a question here from Wendy. Have any of the speakers worked with the Mastery Consortium Portfolio Project? Um, I have not. I have heard the name and said, put it on my list. This is something I need to check out. <laughs> so that's not much, but it's a little bit. You want to tell us anything about that, Wendy? You, you can unmute. Mm -hmm. We've got Pat uh, Fitzsimmons endorsing the uh, MTC Hi, this well. is Wendy. I Thanks, am not Wendy. an expert in the Mastery Consortium. My understanding is that they take the idea of a student portfolio and say, to what extent could that serve as a transcript, particularly mm. um, transitioning from high school to college to showcase competencies. And I think it could be compatible with a lot of the work that you've been talking about. Um, so I encourage you to look into it. I, I'm not working directly with them right now, but uh, they've presented at Aurora conferences in the past and they have, I, I'm going to say, many, many different districts and states that have been partnering with them around this project to try to see if we can have different ways for uh, showcasing student work. Perfect. I could Other just add a comment to that. I think they really can align very nicely with a portrait of a graduate. 
um, because of the different buckets that are on the first page when you look at the um, the transcript. And I love how it's visual and it shows where a student has really um, what they've emphasized in their learning journey. Mm. And um, they can also include evidence. So if an admissions officer wants to find out more about the student, they can click on something and see actual student work. Pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. Nice. I'm looking at it now. Yeah. Well, it looks like uh, some important uh, additional collaboration we're going to need to do. Yeah. Other questions, comments? Uh, let's see, Sid has um, a thumbs up for MTC, okay. Actually, he's talking about uh, the, um, uh, the co correlation in his state between their uh, um, LMS and so forth. Does anybody know which state uh, Sid represents since he's having to drop? Utah, I think, wasn't it? Oh yeah, that's right. I think he may be right. I, Canvas is based here in Utah, so. As as is Brandt, so yeah. <laughs> other comments, thoughts. Happy to have you share your experiences. Mm -hmm. Well, should we turn this back over to you, Natalie? Sure. Yes. Thank you. Had to get myself off of mute there. Um, Yes, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And please join me in giving a warm thank you to our presenters in the chat box today. Uh, what a terrific presentation, so much great information. And this idea of a universal comprehensive learner record um, or wallet with verified credentials is such an important piece of the work in shifting to competency-based education systems. Um, so we are really grateful for the work that you all are leading and really terrific um, presentation today. So if you all don't mind taking a one minute survey, I just dropped the link into the chat box. It's really quick, just a few quick questions. We really do value your feedback and uh, use it to design our future webinars. So we'd appreciate you taking a moment there. Um, and if you can shift to the next slide, we just invite you all to stay connected to the Aurora Institute. Um, you'll see the link to our website, ways you can get in contact with us, and we encourage you to follow us on social media. And with that, I'm happy to conclude today's webinar. Um, so thank you all again. We'll, we'll share the webinar recording and the slides with you all shortly and hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Natalie. Yeah, thanks, so much. thanks, Jean. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Brent. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.